when a murder is discovered. And what you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. It doesn't just destroy one life. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else. It's really tough. Well, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. It tears communities apart. When I arrived at the scene, the first thing I went and saw was the body in the wood. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. Homicides are the ultimate. That's the climax. That's what this job is all about. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. From a forensic point of view, perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this case is that conviction was achieved without the body. In this episode, a 33-year-old Sunday school teacher is found dead in her apartment. A cord around the neck, unclothed from the waist down, in the bathtub, that pretty much told us murder. The people have said that she was awesome, that she was one that you could always talk to. It's so crazy that she's gone. Meet the murder detectives. He had motive, he had means, and he had opportunity. Who reveal how they caught the killer. We're wearing bulletproof vests, but we're wearing plain clothes. We're driving unmarked police cars, and that's all exciting stuff. That's what cops become cops to do. In the Central Valley of California lies Modesto. In 2001, it had grown from a quiet town to a busy industrial city, and with it, a rise in violent crime. In March of that year, a 33-year-old female named Susan Iyer was found dead in the bathroom of her apartment in North Modesto. It was a late Friday afternoon at the end of a work week. I was at my desk finishing up reports from other cases that I was working on, and we got a call from one of the supervisors saying a murder had occurred and we needed to go out and take a look at it. Detective John Bueller had worked on homicide investigations for more than 12 years, but what he discovered at this crime scene shocked even him. It was a typical small bathroom, and Susan was in the bathtub where the killer had placed her. And he had filled the tub up with water. It just, it just looked bad. Susan was unclothed from the waist down. She still had her shirt on. John's partner, Al Bracchini, took witness statements to discover more about the victim, Susan Iyer. Here's a gal that is pure as snow. This is a gal that didn't have any enemies. You'd want her to be your sister or your girlfriend or your wife. I mean, this is a nice person. And so it's shocking. I mean, I came from five years before homicide work in gangs, and so you're constantly looking at bad guy shooting bad guy, drive-by shootings, sexual assaults and things. This is one where, you know, you want to get justice. They discovered Susan was a Sunday school teacher at a church out of town. These are our Sunday school classes, and this is where Susan would have worked. To be a Sunday school teacher, number one, you'd have to love the kids. Number two, you'd have to have a fun personality. And my understanding is that Susan was really good at all of that. This news made what they found at the scene of the crime even more disturbing. In addition to her being in the bathtub, she also had an electrical cord around her neck. Now, it was the same type of cord that would be used for like an electric power drill or something like that. It was very obvious because it was an orange color. And of course, a cord around the neck, unclothed from the waist down, in the bathtub, that pretty much told us murder. The crime scene can hold a great many clues, but it does depend, actually, was that the site where the victim was killed? It might be a deposition site, in which case it might offer different sorts of opportunities for clues. So that's a whole different set of priorities for the senior investigating officer to think about. Local crime reporter Daryl Farnsworth 
had picked up the story on the police scanner and was already at the scene. The Susan Iyer case sticks out in my mind because it was so senseless that the killer went over there and killed a beautiful young lady who was a lot of people's best friend, a daughter. Susan was a true innocent victim. She was the proverbial virgin Sunday school teacher. She was single, she was a hard worker at the business where she was working in the office. She had a select group of friends and they were all good people, very good Christian people. Here in the church when that happened, it was a huge surprise to everybody because she's not one that you'd expect would be caught up in something uh, that tragic. John learned it was Susan's parents who had alerted the police. This is the location where I was called on a late Friday afternoon. There's a stairway that goes up to a landing and then it splits and one of the stairways goes up to the right, one goes to the left. Susan's apartment was on the stairway to the left. When a delivery wasn't successfully made by a store to deliver a refrigerator to her house, her parents tried to reach her and they couldn't get a hold of her. So they drove from their home in a neighboring town to Modesto. They had a key for her apartment and they went in and then that's when Susan's father actually discovered Susan deceased in the bathtub. It must have been horrific for Susan's family to find her. I can't even imagine. They went over there expecting to find their daughter and here's her body in the bathtub. It was just terrible. Can't put myself in that place. It was horrible. Susan lived in a quiet complex of smart condos in North Modesto. This kind of crime surprised a lot of people over here because it's not a high crime area. It's not where you would expect something like this to happen. Nobody saw anything, heard anything. They didn't see anybody go to the apartment or leave the apartment. And there were no other problems in the complex. And for her to be murdered in that horrific way, I think other residents thought, maybe I'm next. While talking to Susan's parents, John discovered Susan was supposed to be moving house so she could be nearer to them and her best friend. There were boxes that were labeled. They were stacked neatly around the apartment. Things were already packed. There was very little that was left that hadn't been packed. It just didn't look like a place where a crime occurred. Susan had never reached her new home. She was brutally murdered while packing up. John and the team searched for any clues that might lead them to a motive. Susan's apartment was very neat and clean, even for somebody that was moving out. It wasn't dirty, and so although there was an odor of bleach in the bathroom where her body was, I couldn't tell for sure if it was bleach that was put in the water of the bathtub or if it was just a cleaning of bleach. The CSI team took a sample of the water in the bath to be analyzed for the presence of bleach. Although bleach is a common household product, it's not expected that most people would understand the effects of bleach on a human body. This case does suggest that the individual, the perpetrator, had some higher level of knowledge. The murder scene provided little in the way of clues for Alan John to work with. Recording every detail was vital. Her purse was like spilled out and there was no money in it. The door was unlocked and the bathroom door was locked. There was a blood spot that was in the carpet of the bedroom, just steps away from the bathroom. And it wasn't a giant blood spot or anything like that, but it was noticeable. It seemed out of place because of the cleanliness of the rest of her apartment. But they both knew the absence of evidence also told a story. The one thing that stuck out the most early on was the fact that there was no evidence of somebody forcing their way into her apartment. And there was only one way in, the front door. So if nobody forced their way in, it puts us in a position to think that she probably knew the killer. Susan lived a quiet Christian life in Modesto. But the city could be a dangerous place to live. 2001, Modesto was getting active, pretty active on the crime scene as the population began to swell. There was murder every week or two. They have gangs, they have drugs, they have homicides, but they have good people too. 
John and Al worked together in the homicide team for seven years, taking it in turns to be lead investigator on a case. The things we did were dark and they were depressing, but our work environment was very, very enjoyable because of the people that we worked with. John Bueller, he was kind of a mentor to me. I mean, I did solve a few of his cases for him. I was the lead on 26 murder cases I investigated with my partners over 140. When it comes to shocking murder cases, every one of them was shocking to the family members that were left behind. But in particular for us, the real shocking ones were innocent victim murders. Susan's case was one of those. John applied his years of experience to the investigation. On any murder case, we work the murder from the victim outwards. So if the victim is in the center of a circle, we can go in any direction like the hands on a clock from the, the victim themselves. So we look at the victim and we see what goes on in their life, get an idea of if there was somebody that had an issue with them or there was a, some confrontation that was brewing. It makes sense to start close to home, and, and of course we know from statistics that females murdered indoors, the most likely suspect is actually her sexual partner or her husband or her boyfriend or an estranged partner. Our canvas the neighbours taking detailed statements of what they'd seen or heard the night before. One of the first witnesses I spoke to was a lady that lived downstairs directly below where the victim lived, and she was visibly upset. The witness told Al there was nothing unusual when she went to bed at 11 p.m., but shortly afterwards, she heard a loud bang. It sounded to her like a large box had fallen on the floor, and it woke her up. She said she can't be positive, but she thinks she heard a yelp, a sharp yelp. And then she heard running, heavy footsteps from the bedroom to the kitchen to the bathroom, and she could hear this from downstairs, and then she heard the water get turned on on the bathtub. And then she believes what she hears is somebody coming down the stairs. She's a mess. I mean, she believes if she would have just woke up, called somebody, did something, maybe this would be different. This information gave John an hour time frame to work with. Susan's mother reported speaking to her at 10.30 p.m. and a neighbor heard the bath being run around 11.30 p.m. People talk about a gut instinct and for cops that have done the job for a while, you usually have an idea of something and my gut instinct was, of course, that Susan knew her killer. But as far as who it would be without talking to more people, I didn't have anything that was really pointing in any specific direction. The hunt for Susan's killer had only just begun but John and the team had no idea who would want to kill this innocent Sunday school teacher. In Modesto, California, 33-year-old Sunday school teacher Susan Iyer had been found dead in her flat. She was about to move to a new home nearer her parents and her church. The people have said that she was awesome, that she was one that you could always talk to. She kept to herself, but wasn't standoffish. So crazy that she's gone. Susan's body had been discovered by her parents, and Detective John Bueller called on them at home that evening to update them. As luck would have it, Susan's best friend was there at Susan's parents' house. We learned that Susan was going to be maid of honor in her upcoming wedding. She was gonna be marrying a guy named Chris Mulvaney. The friend's fiance was also at Susan's parents' house. He had said that we should look at Susan's ex because he liked weapons and he was kind of an unusual person and he could be a violent person. Chris told John that Susan had ended the relationship six months ago and since then, the boyfriend had acted strangely. Her ex-boyfriend would be the closest one to her in a sense that maybe could be involved in this. So we knew he was important and it would have to be cleared out first. But then equally important would be those people that lived in the complex that could be involved in this. We heard from the family that Susan was creeped out by some people in the apartment complex. That kind of investigation where you've got somebody who really 
you know, is a very quiet person that lives alone, that the investigation would have to start from the idea that this might be a random stranger attack. Somebody could have come to the door selling something. Somebody could have just passed by. She could have walked a different way to her church and something there might offer a clue as to, as to who the suspect was. There was little evidence for detectives Al Brocchini and John Bueller to work with until the results of the forensic examination began to arrive the next day. Because Susan had been in the bathtub full of water, the water doesn't do the body any good once you die. And so they moved the autopsy up to Saturday. It was a murder, according to the forensic pathologists, that it was probably done with injuries to the neck and that there was other trauma to the body indicating a sexual assault. Sexual assault is a key thing in an investigation like this because it showed that the killer had some unusual interest in the victim that didn't include robbery or something like that. John and Al now began to suspect that Susan may have been targeted for her innocence. I probably talked to five people, and one of the first five things they tell me about Susan is besides that she's a Sunday school teacher, a great gal, is she's a virgin. And it was something that she wasn't ashamed of. She was, I don't want to say proud, but she was waiting till she was married. The sexual assault gave them a possible motive and the chance of DNA evidence. But the killer had used bleach on the crime scene and in the bath, which could have an impact on any forensic evidence. If the bleach was used to, for example, attempt to clean a scene, chlorine bleach would clean away a substance like blood to the naked eye, but it would not totally destroy any evidence that would indicate that blood had previously been there. DNA swabs had been taken from Susan's body, but John and Al would have to wait weeks for the results. In the meantime, they started to work on a profile of the killer. This was a very personal crime, a very violent crime, where she knew the killer by letting him in. Susan was murdered for her virginity, is what I believe. Sex is a very defiling act. You take a virginal bride and you defile her. It's almost symbolic. So someone that proclaims their virginity and leads a very squeaky clean life would be a real target, particularly for someone who is less than perfect. There was a killer on the loose and John and Al had to find him before he struck again. What I did is I just put together this list right here and it just had the 12 people that seem to fit into those categories of acquaintances, co-workers, and people that lived in the apartment complex that she felt a little creepy about. Top of the list was Susan's ex. They'd been told he'd acted suspiciously after they broke up, so he was invited to come down to the station the next day. He looked like a guy that just walked out of the waves holding a surfboard. He had kind of the bleach blonde hair. And John had a surprise for him. He asked him to take a lie detector test, known as a polygraph. Well, the polygraph is a machine that measures your respiration, how quickly you breathe, how deeply you breathe. It measures your pulse rate. And can it be beaten? I guess it can. The polygrapher drew up a series of questions, then asked the subject to tell an obvious lie before moving on. By comparing readings, a lie could be detected. So when he asked that question, did you kill Susan? He can use the earlier lie response to compare with the response for the true question that we're looking for the answer in. He passed the polygraph. He showed no deception as far as being involved in, in the murder. And I came away from talking to him liking him. So if the ex was clear, why did Chris Mulvaney point the finger at him? And did the ex-boyfriend feel the same way about Chris? I said, well, what about Chris? And he immediately said, no, no way. He's getting married. He's just a regular guy. I know him. He's a friend of mine. And that was interesting to me, that I got two separate guys where one's kind of attacking another, and the other one doesn't have anything bad to say. That rang alarm bells for John, and he made a note to look more closely at Chris. 
as word spread about Susan's tragic death, the community mourned, not least those at the church where she worked as a Sunday school teacher. She was an incredible uh, person. She was incredibly kind. She loved the kids. She loved the people. Uh, she was a family person. It was felt throughout the church. The funeral was packed. The shock was felt across Modesto. Everybody's interested, all the readers in the town. Everybody wanted to know what happened, what happened. And we'd get calls, hey, is there anything new on the Susan Iyer case? What's new, what's new? John and Al had only released minimal information to the public in the hope the killer would trip himself up under questioning. In the next 48 hours, they strategically worked through their list of suspects to rule them in or out of the investigation. I had to go back to those neighbors upstairs. Al had spoken to them on his first day canvassing the neighborhood. One who had said he was home on the day Susan was killed now said he had gone out at the time of the murder to buy food. I asked him if he had the receipts still. He actually did, and it showed that he got home around 1.20. And so he's kind of up in the neighborhood of that time frame. He also told Al he'd been to see a friend the night of Susan's death, something he hadn't mentioned before. You know, that kind of gives you a little uh, gut check. I mean, OK, he starts out lying to me. And he's up in the time frame. He lives upstairs. The neighbor hears stuff from upstairs. This man fitted the profile. The team had another suspect. They asked him to come in for an interview and to take a lie detector test, which he passed. That was one less suspect on the list, but there were still several to rule out. John mentioned that he had called the victim's best friend and he had spoken to Chris Mulvaney. Chris had some pertinent information on the phone, and so John wanted to follow up on it. While Al interviewed Susan's best friend, John talked to her fiance, Chris. Susan's best friend was very helpful. I mean, she wanted to help the best she could. She also told me that Susan was seeing somebody else on the, I think she called it the hush hush. It was somebody from work. And we had to figure out who that guy was to see if he passed muster or if he went over there or not. With Chris, I'm acting like his best friend. And I'm acting like almost like a colleague. I need your help. Thanks for coming in. You throw a couple of compliments here because you want to continue to keep that line of communication open. John learned that Chris worked at a mortuary in Turlock, a nearby town. And he lived in a flat above it. I asked him what he thought of our victim, Susan Iyer. And he had said, well, I, I don't really find her that attractive. She's got a face that looks kind of like a scrunched up rat. And I just thought, this is unusual for you know, a tragedy like this to be referring to the dead that way. When John and Al got together after the interview, they realized Chris and his fiance's statements couldn't be more different. I asked her what Chris thought of Susan. And she said that Chris had always said Susan was a nice looking woman. And it, her exact quote was, what more would a man want? Well, that kind of just contradicts what John had learned from him. So it was something that, you know, we can look at each other and like, whoa, you know, what's that all about? But just another clue. Police were asking everyone to account for their movements on the night of Susan's murder. Chris told John he'd been working at the mortuary and had gone to pick up a body with a colleague, then finish for the night. He said this could be confirmed by his fiance. To me, that wasn't really much of an alibi because I really didn't know if she would lie for him or not because they were engaged to be married. So I made note of it, and I knew we had to check into it a little bit more by doing some digging. There was something else that caught John's eye. All the interviewed suspects, including Chris, had been given a cup of water. When the interview was completed with Chris, he took that cup with him, which is not really a big deal in itself. But to compare him taking the cup when everybody else that was interviewed left their cup behind was suspicious to me. Because Chris knew that DNA trace could be found on a cup that he had put to his mouth. We checked all over the place, and we knew that he'd taken that cup when he left. In the next 48 hours, the team tracked down everyone on the list. 
She had a chimney sweep in there that kind of gave her the creeps. She had a maintenance man in there fixing her heater that definitely gave her the creeps. And investigated their alibi the night of the murder. What we're able to do is efficiently get rid of people that don't need to be investigated anymore. And as we weed out, we go from 12 down to 8, down to 4, down to 1. As we do that, we're able to put the case together because with everybody you clear from suspicion, more suspicion mounts on Chris Mulvaney. In the suburbs of Modesto, California, 33-year-old Susan Iyer had been found dead in her bathtub. Detectives John Bueller and Al Brocchini had begun their investigation with 12 suspects, but one by one had ruled them out. They were now left with just one man, Susan's best friend's fiance, Chris Mulvaney. He actually made himself a suspect. He implanted himself in this case from almost the first day by trying to point fingers at Susan's former fiance. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed little at a time. Chris worked at a mortuary in local town Turlock and now claimed that on the night of Susan's death, he'd been working. When we did more digging into Chris's alibi, what we found is his claim actually was changed slightly. Initially, he'd claimed while working at the morgue, he had been out to pick up one body. But when re-questioned, he said he went out to collect more bodies at 11 p.m. Al went to Turlock to investigate. Susan had a lot of friends in Turlock. Her best friend lives in Turlock. And she was going to move to Turlock the day after she was murdered. Al had to confirm Chris's alibi. And as the mortuary used an answering service to take calls when Chris was out on a job, he went to them first. They keep a very detailed log because they answer phones for a lot of businesses, but they know exactly the time somebody calls in, who calls in, what phone number they called from. Eight o'clock, he left to go pick up a body. And at 11 o'clock that night, he came back, called the answering service and says, I'm back. Did I get any messages? And they said no. And then he told the answering service, I'm going to go pick up three more bodies. Then he called back at around 1.20 in the morning and said, I'm back. So we know from, you know, 11 o'clock to 1.20, he wasn't at the mortuary. He says he was out picking up bodies. Susan was thought to be killed at around midnight the time Chris said he was picking up an additional three bodies. I also know that it's mandatory if he picks up a body, there has to be two morticians, unless he's going to a hospital. And so I interviewed his partner, who also lives here, who went with him at 8 o'clock and picked up a body and got home at 11. And he didn't know anything about any more bodies. Chris's alibi was starting to fall apart. Al had one more interview to make that would prove Chris's story one way or another. So I talked to the owner of the mortuary, and he said they picked up one body that night, and it was in the morgue by 11 o'clock, and there were no more bodies picked up. So if Chris told me or the operator or his fiance he was out picking up bodies, he was lying. One week after the murder was discovered, Chris Mulvaney was our prime suspect. As they investigated Chris Mulvaney, stories about his behavior started to surface. Chris was involved in death in a very intimate way. Well, he would come to the coroner's office frequently to pick up bodies that had been released for the funeral home where he worked at the mortuary. Also at the coroner's office was Christy R. U., who ran a funeral home and had had dealings with Chris in the past. On a usual day, he was somebody that was charismatic and you could have a conversation with him. He was quite funny. He was a reasonably attractive person, well put together. But on this day, I knew that there was something wrong. It had been the day after Susan's death and her body was at the coroner's office. He was starting to ask some unusual questions he was asking about, does water cover up evidence? And things like that, just 
really inappropriate questions. Did you find out if Susan had been raped? Now, why would anybody ask that question? He was talking to them about body position. Chris revealed he knew Susan's body was found face down in the bathtub, a detail that hadn't been released to the public. He knew that she was in the water. He just had details that he shouldn't have, not so soon. I just engaged in a deeper level of conversation, you know, like, oh my goodness, it's so sad that Susan passed away, you know, how did you know her? He was just describing things that you wouldn't really talk about when somebody passes away, like what she looked like, how tall she was. He was very intent on conveying to me that he did not think she was attractive. And he wanted to let me know that she looked like a mouse. He was too familiar with the case. He was too interested in the case. He knew that she had been sexually assaulted. And I found that if your wife's best friend has passed away, you're not even going to be probably showing up to work. You're going to be at home supporting your wife. That would be usual and typical. I'm a person that exercises discernment. And when I'm talking to somebody, I can tell they're not being honest with me. Chris coming in and asking me these questions, it was absolutely outrageous. It was just outrageous, the things that he was saying. Chris said that the reason he was asking these questions, when asked by Christy why he was so curious, is that Chris was doing this for Susan's father, because Susan's father just couldn't bear to stand talking about this. So I called Susan's father, and the first thing he told me when I reviewed this information with him is these words, you've got your man. He never gave Chris information about how the body was positioned in the bathtub. And the only people who knew that were those of us working the case who went on the other side of the yellow tape and Susan's parents. When I was talking to Chris, there was no doubt in my mind that he was the person that killed Susan. No doubt whatsoever. Although John and the team were convinced Chris was the killer, there was still a lack of forensic evidence. Bleach had been found in the bathwater and had been used to wipe down the surfaces. Even if Chris's fingerprints were found, he'd put something in place to explain their presence. On the original interview, Chris put himself at the crime scene. He had told me that he had been at Susan's apartment the day before the murder. Al asked Chris's fiance if she could confirm this was true. She was shocked that he said he went over there because he had never gone over there by himself. I don't think she suspected anything, but she was trying to be as helpful as she could. He went over there to discuss details on the wedding with her, things about releasing doves and hiring a country singer to help out with the entertainment. Unbeknownst to Chris, I knew the country singer. He told me, absolutely not. Nobody's called me to entertain at the wedding, and I certainly would remember it if somebody did. John had caught Chris in another lie. I was keeping track on all the circumstantial evidence that had come up during our investigation, and they included 41 things that pointed towards Chris Mulvaney. He knew the victim. She did not support his relationship with his fiance. She really didn't care for him. She had told others that she didn't feel comfortable around him. He deflected suspicion away by talking negative about her ex. John and Al had to take this circumstantial evidence to the district attorney's office. Would it be enough to get an arrest warrant for Chris Mulvaney? Or would Chris figure out they were onto him and go on the run? Detectives John Bueller and Al Brocchini had been working on the murder of 33-year-old Susan Iyer for just eight days, and they believed they had their killer, Christopher Mulvaney, who was engaged to Susan's best friend. Everything that we looked at in this case reveals to us that Chris used probably some sort of a ruse to get in Susan's apartment. He may have told her that he wanted to talk about plans for the wedding. Once inside, it seems likely that he tackled her on the floor, attacked her on the floor, killed her, put her in the bathtub, filled it with water, put the bleach in, and then left. I think he went over there to kill her, 
because he wanted to have sex with her because she was a virgin. And this was driving him crazy, apparently. And he knew he was going to have to kill her because she wasn't going to agree to it. Susan's body had been found in a bathtub filled with water and bleach. John believed that the killer had hoped that this bleach would destroy any evidence of sexual assault, but it hadn't. DNA evidence had been found on the body. In cases of rape, depending on where the semen would be found, if bleach was introduced to the system, for example, into a cavity, if it was oxygen-based bleach, then this is highly likely to destroy any DNA evidence. However, chlorine bleach may not, and there may in fact be DNA evidence that would persist after the fact. John and the team took their case to the district attorney and were granted an arrest warrant and warrants to search his apartment and to take Christopher's blood to test his DNA. He had motive, he had means, and he had opportunity because his alibi had been destroyed. I started believing he did it when his alibi got blown up. I started believing he did it because just because of the guy he was. He gave the creeps to everybody. He put himself in Susan's apartment. He did a lot of things to make us focus on him. He's thinking of helping himself, but he's really helping us. The decision was made to charge Chris, but John wanted to take this killer in quietly. We came up with a plan where we contacted his employer at the mortuary, and we told them that we needed their help to get Chris to come in for our last interview, because we were pretty sure this would be the last interview that Chris would be involved in. The mortuary agreed to take a call from John while Chris was at work asking him to go down to the station. The team would then search his apartment and track him on his way to the station. All of us that were here, we're prepared for whatever's gonna happen. We're wearing bulletproof vests, but we're wearing plain clothes. We're driving unmarked police cars that all have lights and sirens. We're all armed, of course. We all have radios, we have phones. So whatever's gonna happen, we're going to be able to deal with it. If he got on a freeway and started going south rather than towards the PD, we would have stopped him. We would have rammed him if we had to. And that's all exciting stuff. That's what cops become cops to do. The phone call was placed. The employees at the mortuary went to Chris and told him that he needed to come up to Modesto Police Department to help the detectives in this heinous murder. Chris agreed to be interviewed and decided to take his fiance with him, Susan's best friend. We saw him come out of the apartment, and rather than go to the work car, the hearse, he went to their personal car, which kind of raises the hair on your back a little bit because now he could run. That's why we were here. Al and the team followed Chris and his fiance out of Turlock and onto the freeway. To everyone's relief, they turned towards Modesto and onto the police station. Once they arrived, John took Chris, and I had Chris's fiance stay with another detective, and then I searched their car. At this time, Chris still thinks that he's a helpful witness, somebody who's benefiting our investigation, and we didn't do anything intentionally to alleviate that thought. We were giving him that false sense of security that we really needed his help. As we moved through that interview, I originally had asked him if he had a good recall of what had taken place on the day of the murder. And he told me at the start of the interview, well, of course I did. It was a traumatic thing. So I remember everything. But now I've got him committed to that right now before I even start the meat and potatoes of the interview. So as we start moving through the interview, the questions are becoming more pointed. They're more direct. And every time he would give me an answer, that I already knew was a lie, I would confront him with the evidence that I had that showed he just lied to me. You could tell that he knew he was in trouble. He wasn't liking us as much as he did. Now he was trying to think of a way out. He was kind of like a rat trapped in a cage at that point. He wanted an attorney. Well, here in California, if he asks for an attorney, all questioning has to stop. If you're innocent, you're not going to lawyer up. You're going to try and help in the investigation. John already had a warrant that enabled him to arrest Christopher on the spot and take him down to the hospital to get a DNA sample. Meanwhile, Al broke the news to his fiance. I told her, you need a ride home. And she said, you know, why? I said, well, Chris isn't going home. Chris is going to jail for the murder of your best friend. 
Chris's fiance was shocked. He had appeared to be a normal guy. The perpetrator's ordinariness stemmed from his logical approach to life, to his struggle to maintain normality. Um, his difficulty in doing that to suppress his more narcissistic, more violent tendencies. Christopher Mulvaney was a moron. Anybody who goes around killing people is a moron. He thought he was smart because he used the bleach. He thought, OK, I'm home free now, you know? I've got this story I've concocted, and they don't have any evidence. At that point of the investigation, we had circumstantial evidence that was weaving a nice big rope to put around his neck. But there was one thing that was missing from that rope, and that was the DNA results. DNA had been taken from the sexual assault on Susan, and if it matched Christopher's DNA, the case would be watertight. We're waiting on pins and needles for the DNA evidence to come back. If it came back and it wasn't Chris's DNA in there, we might have a problem with our case. While the team waited for the DNA results, Chris went before a grand jury to decide if there's enough evidence to go to trial. He pleaded not guilty and a trial date was set. John and Al continued to build their case. What detectives are doing is they're trying to create a narrative ready for the prosecutor to present in court, and that's sometimes referred to as the prosecution narrative. It was a number of months later that the DNA results came back. The summary of the results were there was one person out of 100 billion that could have contributed the evidence that was left behind on Susan, and that was Chris Mulvaney. So his I'm innocent claim went to, I'm pleading guilty to this, I don't want a trial, possibly because he didn't want to risk going and getting a death penalty. Chris raped her, nobody else in the world but him, and so that was pretty much the last nail in his coffin. He was given life without possibility of parole, and I remember that the judge who pronounced the sentencing on him made a kind of a unique statement. The judge told Chris that the next time that he would see freedom is after he died and was taken out of the prison in a coffin. He deserved the death penalty, but if he's never going to see the light of day, then that's good too, because he's just sitting there in prison rotting. And there's a lot of people happy to see that, including her family, I'm sure. Chris never would contact us to explain why he did what he did. It seems evident to me that Chris had an unreasonable fantasy about Susan and her virginity and was extremely attracted to her, knowing that he could never have this prize of being with this girl that he fantasized about so much. And the only thing that he could do that was close to that was to have his way with her and then kill her. The combination of being able to arrest him and have the DNA results confirm that he was involved in this. That was gratifying to us, but I've never yet seen anything like this that replaces that loss that the family feels. We see a lot of darkness working homicide. I want to believe that we didn't get changed, John or me. It didn't change us. We're still the same as we were. We just saw some darkness, and we had some success, and we brought some justice. This was a heinous case, just senseless. And he killed the, a wonderful young woman. Susan Iyer, she was loved by so many people.